The Speaking From Experience Entrepreneurship Lecture Series, presented by Champlain College's BYO Biz Program, brings leading entrepreneurs to campus to share their experience and wisdom with students and the local community. In this episode, we present John Abley, co-founder of Boston Scientific, speaking about his family's quest to find the USS Grunion, a submarine that vanished mysteriously off the Aleutian Islands during World War II. Hello everyone, my name is uh, David Finney. I'm the president of Champlain College. It's a privilege and a pleasure to welcome you all here tonight. Glad to, uh, glad to see all of you. Um, we, how many of you have been in this building before? Most of you. So you've heard the spiel about, uh, about the Perry Center. Okay. Um, we are uh, happy to uh, host this tonight, uh, this event, and the uh, sponsor, co-sponsor is the Ethan Allen Institute, and uh, Rob uh, Roper is here to tell us a little bit about that and also to introduce our, uh, our speaker. We are in for a treat tonight. Thank you very much, David. Uh, thank you all for coming out on this wonderful night. I just want to, I'm not going to take up much time. I just want to thank uh, Champlain College for giving us this space and helping us to spread the word about this event. Um, our speaker tonight, as you know, is, is John Abley. Uh, he's going to be telling us about, uh, I think it's just an incredible story. Um, but before he gets into it, I do want to take just two seconds to tell you a little bit about the Ethan, Inst Ethan Allen Institute if you're not familiar with it. Uh, we are Vermont's free market oriented think tank. Uh, we're one of about uh, 60 think tanks around the country. Every state has one, at least one. Uh, call, uh, and we're bound loosely together by a group called the State Policy Network. It's a great way to share resources. Some uh, think tanks are really big. Some of them are really small, like the Ethan Allen Institute, but we're growing. That's uh, Shane Spence in the back. We just hired Shane on, so uh, we've doubled the size of the organization. <laughs> but, uh, as a free market oriented uh, think tank, we, we, we love the idea of entrepreneurialism and the idea of, of people following their hopes and dreams. The, the uh, Declaration of Independence talks about you know, pursuit of happiness. And uh, so when people have an idea, when they have a passion, uh, we love to see how they follow through. It's, it's a great story. And John Abley has certainly led an entrepreneurial life uh, as a co founder of, of, of Boston Scientific. But this particular uh, the story has an entrepreneurial side to it as well. It's an entrepreneurial, it, it's a des desire to find out what happened to his father, who was a captain of a submarine uh, during World War II that went down um, off the Aleutians. And his desire and his family's desire to find their, their father's final resting place and the resting place of the crew led to an incredible tale. Of, uh, it's, it's about technology, it's about passion, it's about bureaucracy. A lot of the things that the Ethan Allen Institute uh, talks about every day, but this in, in a fascinating and wonderful way. So uh, if you're interested in learning more about the Ethan Allen Institute, there's a sign-up sheet in the back over by the cookie tray. Uh, we'd love to have you sign up for our email list and get our newsletter and, stuff and, uh, and whatnot. But uh, for tonight, I'm just delighted that we can uh, put on this event with Champlain College and give you, uh, I think, what's going to be a very informative, entertaining, and, uh, and eye-opening uh, presentation from John Ailey. John, thank you very much. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, Dave, uh, and, and, and welcome. Uh, it's kind of interesting. You are, in fact, guinea pigs for a talk I'm giving next week at the World War II Museum in New Orleans. And uh, it is fascinating because uh, the World War II uh, interest in history has always dominated a lot of people's thoughts. That wasn't just a war. <laughs> that was, admittedly, the second war to end all wars. And uh, this is a component of it. Uh, let me go right. So it's, it's the search for the Grunion. And uh, more significantly, this story is somewhat complicated. Uh, there are many themes of it. Is the history. There's personal histories. I'll get into that. Geography, genealogy, tons of genealogy, that's how you find people. Obviously technology, forensics, um, international collaboration. Uh, really quite amazing all over the world just for looking for this, kind of interesting. Flock of birds, wisdom of crowds, that's uh, lots of people working towards a common goal without an obvious leader. 
they establish their own sub goals and go out and do them. And this is what happened and what made it uh, so, so fascinating. Perhaps the most amazing is the number of improbables that occurred doing this. There are coincidences, and then there are improbable coincidences. And uh, you will see as we get into this. First of all, this is our uh, welcome. Uh, our family in, in 1941, this is Tiverton, Rhode Island. That's my mother, my, my brother Brad in back, me on the chair, uh, our dad. He was called Jim, and we as boys always called him Jim. I'm not exactly sure why, but, but that, was, that was what happened. And then my brother Bruce on the other chair. And this is uh, Jim with his uh, Navy uniform. And this is the actual submarine that that's a, a model of. It was called a Gato class. And they, they made uh, uh, a number of them. This was number 216. Um, actually, it's not on this, but you'll see it in other pictures. Uh, this is its war picture. And they take the numbers off. Now think about the fact that if we found it, how do we identify it? OK, got the, got the challenge. Anyway, this is a long tube. It's, it's a little bit longer than a football field. Uh, it's 30 feet wide on the outside and only 16 feet wide on the inside. If you're claustrophobic, sorry. This is probably not the service you want to be in. Uh, it uh, is a hybrid. It's like a Prius. Um, it's got diesel for on the surface and electric uh, underneath. So that was not a, a new invention. Uh, this is a picture from uh, New London, Connecticut, where the, uh, the crew and their wives were assembled. Not everybody, but most of the people. These artifacts were essential for us as we went back and tried to identify families. Not a trivial task. So uh, the timeline of this was uh, 1942. Uh, the USS Grunion was launched uh, at the end of 41 or early 42. It was the first submarine launched uh, after the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And uh, if you remember your history there, 1942 was not the best year for the US military, having been, you know, our, our surface fleet really damaged uh, in Pearl Harbor. And uh, the Japanese were sort of moving uh, everywhere. Uh, the USS Grunion was uh, sent on patrol. It sailed from New London, Connecticut, where it was built, uh, went through the Panama Canal and, and up to uh, Pearl Harbor, and immediately left for the Aleutian Islands. The Aleutian Islands were at that point occupied by the Japanese or at least two of the islands were. That's a big deal. Those were United States uh, territory, and the Japanese had attacked and occupied. So whether it was strategic from a functional point of view, it wasn't. Uh, but it certainly was strategic from a symbolic point of view. And that was important to both sides. Uh, yeah, let me go back to this. Uh, my mother. Uh, we had moved to Newton, Massachusetts after our dad went to war. And uh, in uh, September of 1942, she received this sort of classic telegram, we regret to inform you. But it wasn't a regret to inform you that your husband died. It was he was lost. And more importantly, she wasn't supposed to tell anybody about it because that might you know, uh, make the enemy feel better. Uh, so we didn't want to do that. And my mother, uh, being the wife of the uh, commander, sent letters to uh, every single family of the crew. In some cases, they, they were uh, spouses. In other cases, they were parents, so forth. Uh, but she hand wrote uh, letters like this. And then she got responses from most, actually, of, of the, these folks. And, I'll just read you uh, a, a section here. Some time ago, I heard from a friend that my son, who was a radio operator in Dutch Harbor, that he, he feels that there was a good chance that they had been captured, and that after the war, he could uh, tell us more. Well, my mother would refuse to believe that he was dead. So she never remarried. And that was one of the reasons 
uh, she chose. We have these uh, free ring binders of all these letters, which were written back in, in, the, in the 40s. Mother became the mother uh, of all those uh, other, other folks, and some of them really needed a lot of mothering. Uh, he was awarded, uh, Jim was awarded the Purple Heart, and, and uh, not the Purple Heart, that's the Navy Cross, uh, and immediately notified all the uh, family members uh, that uh, it was really in all of their names. So basically we grew up, my brothers and I, uh, I have two older brothers uh, and my mother, we uh, grew up in Newton, Massachusetts, uh, went to school, uh, uh, ended up getting married and doing, going to business and doing everything. We, we basically uh, grew up, and by the way, a lot of people had also lost their parent. This was World War II, after all. And so uh, we didn't, uh, we were a very self sufficient family. Uh, later on, I lived in the town of Concord. So, uh, you know, Emerson to me was, you know, self sufficiency. That, that was a big deal. And, but having gone through the Depression and the war, you know, borrowing wasn't something you did much of. So we earned everything, we bought everything with, with our earnings. So in the, in the 90s, my brother Brad, uh, who had served in the Navy, he was a pilot, actually, a uh, jet pilot, and uh, this was in the 50s. And uh, he went on and did his business, but in the 90s he said, you know, people from World War II are dying off. I'm, I want to do research on, on Jim and find out more about him, because at this point, uh, all we knew was that he was lost. We didn't know where he was lost, although we had heard rumors that it was in the Aleutian area, North Pacific. So Brad wrote a book we call The Jim Book, and uh, it was an analysis of interviews from many people who were alive at that time uh, and had either served in the Aleutians or in some cases had taken classes from our dad because he actually taught at Harvard for a year uh, naval science. And, and one of the things that he did is, is uh, there was a gentleman named Endicott Peabody who was in his class and he told my brother that my dad was the best teacher he ever had at Harvard and that was the reason he went into submarines. He volunteered and he went into submarines in World War II. Uh, later became governor of Massachusetts. So lots of little strange uh, connections. Uh, but unfortunately, all we heard was more speculation about what happened. We wondered whether it was friendly fire, because we certainly read tons of instances where submarine commanders would report that they were bombed by, by an American plane, and then the American plane would go back and say that they sunk a Japanese sub. So uh, they didn't have the good signaling techniques that, that uh, they do now. And then, uh, no, unknown to us, uh, in, in the mid-90s, this gentleman, Colonel Richard M. Lane, uh, retired uh, uh, colonel and, uh, in the Air Force, and he was a collector, lived in Colorado, and he found a map. Uh, it's a wiring diagram, really wasn't a map, but a wiring diagram of the Kano Maru. And so he went online to see if he could find out something about it. And we didn't know any of that. But then my brothers, follow this one, my brother's son's girlfriend's boss was a <laughs> World War II buff. And he came across a post that had been written by Colonel Lane describing uh, the fact that uh, the USS Grunion may have had a confrontation with the Kano Maru, a, a cargo ship. And uh, so uh, we were able to learn the name of the translator of this article, because it was written in Japanese. His name was Yutaka Iwasaki. But we didn't have a website. And, and one time I was, 
going through these posts. Now this is 2002, and in the internet world, you have to think about when it happened because the power of the internet was changing literally daily. And uh, I was able to come across a post that had a Utaka Iwasaki, nothing to do with the Grunion, but a website. And so I sent him an email and said, uh, I'm the son of the commander of the United and you wrote an article uh, or translated an article in the Kano Maru. Are you the same Utaka Iwasaki? And literally within 24 hours, I got a, uh, a message back saying, I am he. I pray for the repose of your father's soul. This is Yutaka Iwasaki, and that's his wife. Uh, and this is the actual uh, letter that he sent me. And this, he provided a lot of background information. Took a while to sort of get it back and forth, because there are a lot of things that he would send actual articles on. Uh, this is the Japanese story. And he uh, translated a few of the, the words. But the one that, that, that is sort of important here is it says, we sunk US submarine. That's what that says right there. So um, that was interesting. And uh, it did talk about a battle that took place in the Aleutians. That gave us a head start. And we did more and more research. And actually, in one of the famous books about the Aleutian War, and there, there, aren't, there aren't many books about the Aleutian Wars. <laughs> I don't think either side was terribly excited about writing about it. Uh, it was a bit embarrassing. In many cases, they lost more people to weather than they did to, to each other. But this is the Kano Maru. Uh, it's beached on uh, a harbor in Kiska Island. And uh, they have boats where they were trying to un unload it. So a lot of the cargo of this ship made it to Kiska. The job of the submarines that were off Kiska uh, was to interdict uh, the shipping that was coming from Japan to reinforce their uh, uh, garrison, um, 5,000 people, by the way, uh, on Kiska. So uh, just a little geography here. Uh, so here's the North Pacific Ocean, and this is the Aleutian Island chain. North of that is the Bering Sea, going up uh, in, into the uh, uh, Alaska and Siberia. And uh, at this point, here's a blow up of that. Here's the Aleutian Island chain. And this red line indicates the portion of United States territory that was occupied by Japanese forces. They had another 5,000 on Attu. That was the furthest west. And here's Kiska. And uh, actually, you can't see it, maybe a little corner of it. Uh, but that's uh, uh, Russia, then the Soviet Union. Uh, and then over here is Dutch Harbor, where there was a uh, US naval base which experienced this uh, in 1942 uh, in the process of their attacking uh, Kiska and Attu and occupying it. They bombed that base much closer, uh, kind of as sending a message. And uh, uh, that's the, the next day. There's tons of pictures of the damage they did. Uh, although the damage, as it turns out, was, was not fundamental. They were able to uh, continue to operate out of that. And of course, the United States was committed uh, not to let them hold onto those islands. So then, um, uh, after finding from uh, Utaka uh, this information, uh, I think we all felt pretty good uh, that we learned about our fire. Good. But then in 2005, uh, I met this guy. This is Bob Ballard. And he spoke at a meeting that I spoke at, uh, which was a medical meeting, because I, I do, do, do a lot of that stuff. And he was kind of the entertainment for the evening. And he talked about finding that Titanic. And he is an amazing speaker. 
uh, and really a phenomenal explainer educator. And he did such a good job that I said, you know what, I think we can do that. So I, I talked to him afterwards and uh, turns out he was not able to do it. He was working on some other projects. But he did come out to This Is Boston Scientific uh, to give us a talk about how he would go about doing it. And it's kind of interesting. Uh, he said, number one, don't do it all at once. If you think you're going to do it in one shot, <laughs> you're going to be wasting your time. This is going to take a little bit more time than you thought. You've got to have planning in between. And you will learn a lot, but you won't be able to process it all. And that turned out to be quite true. The second thing he said, the way I found the Titanic was the debris trail. When the thing was sinking, stuff was falling off it. So what you do is you follow that little corn, Hansel and Gretel style, into the actual target. And that turned out to be useful for us as well. So in 2006, uh, we hired a crab boat. That's not exactly an underwater research vessel. Uh, and, and this was a 1970s crab boat. But it has several neat features. It has cranes on it. There's a crane there, and here's another crane here. Obviously, it's a crab boat. It's compounds and lifting up huge traps from underwater. So that was very, very useful. And it had a big open back uh, onto which we could put these uh, cargo containers. And those became offices, if you will, or storage, uh, whatever it is. However, we're going to the sea north of the Aleutians. Now, I don't know if you know anything about the weather out there, <laughs> but it's, it's not the best in the world. And they've got that. There's a television story, uh, something about the dangerous catch or something like that. Uh, gives you an idea of, of the fact that it is, it is sort of tricky. In fact, uh, Cale Garcia, who was the captain of the ship, was actually more valuable to us than the ship. Uh, most people doing research uh, for underwater projects like this would get a ship that has what they call uh, dynamic positioning meaning they can set a button and that has sideways propellers as well as forward and back propellers. And it keeps it in the same uh, geographic uh, position. We didn't have that, but we had better. We had Kale. And, and uh, he was a guy with a lot of knowledge. And his, the entire front cabin had been stove in uh, at one point by waves in one of his trips. So he knew the weather out there. Uh, these are sonar uh, towfish, is what they call them. This is about the size of a motorcycle, a little bit wider. Uh, and there's a second one right, right here. One is at, at a higher frequency than the other. Now, side scan sonar sends out signals to the side, both sides, and it waits for reflections of those signals. And if you hit something metal, you get a pretty good uh, reflection. If you hit a rock, unfortunately, you also get a good reflection. So there's a little bit of a luck of the draw of where your target is. Uh, here's how it worked. Here's the sort of the ship up here. There's a long, long steel cable with, with uh, equipment uh, uh, conducting wires in it. And it's connected to what's called a descender, which is just a very, very heavy weight. And then there's a tether that goes from that to the actual uh, device you saw being launched over the stern. So this thing is holding it down. This is, weighs a couple thousand pounds. And then uh, that is pulled by the boat. Now, this line, we, we had 12,000 feet of a uh, line on a cable, two miles of line. So you, when you let it down, you're not exactly sure wh where it is. And we thought we had a neat way of uh, tracking it. But it turned out a failure in execution <laughs> said we weren't going to be able to do that. So that, that didn't work. Uh, this is what we call the ROV, uh, or the sonar shack. And it has multiple screens in it, so that you're calculating a lot of things all at once. Uh, but you are getting an image being sent back 
from both sides of this side scan sonar device. This was the actual uh, crew plus uh, my, my, my oldest brother, myself, and my middle brother who, who died in 2008 and, and my son there. And then uh, this was part of the crew of uh, the Aquila, that was the crab boat. Uh, in which Cale Garcina and his wife and their two teenage kids, uh, along with a few others, were the crew. These kids were amazing. Talk about homeschooling uh, off the charts, uh, working as crew on a crab boat in the North uh, Pacific is, is quite an education. This was one of the early targets we saw. Now I know, it, to me at least, this looked like sort of a cigarette smudge. Uh, if you're familiar with these things, then you know that's the cigarette smudge and that's the target worth looking at. Uh, we had to look at an area, initially it was about 200 square miles. Uh, and I know that sounds like a lot, but you know, that's better than a million square miles, so we had a good start. It turns out during this time, Utaka not only sent this information, but he collaborated with two other Japanese friends. One was a reporter for the Asahi Shimbun, which is one of Japan's big papers. Uh, and they went to the Japanese National Defense Archives. And they were able to find the log of the Kano Maru. Filed wrong. You know, this is, politics are the same everywhere. And, and uh, they came back with a chart with a uh, mark of where this confrontation took place. So that was the first thing we saw. So they went, uh, they, they took that other uh, towfish, and that has a higher frequency and therefore more resolution. And so now they had this target. That looks a little bit more like a ship. And then they had this one. Now that wiggling is the fact that the towfish was doing this. So you're looking at changing the towfish, not changing the target. And you have to remember that this was on the side of a volcano. That's the, that's the Aleutian Islands are part of the Pacific Rim of Fire. And so it was on the side of a volcano. In fact, when we were thinking about this, we wondered that since the 40s, there have been innumerable earthquakes. And in fact, while we were there, there were 10 earthquakes. We had a volcanologist with us who was a Woods Hole expert. And he was copying, you know, making note. Here's one here, here's one here. So it, it, it's a volcanically active area. And then there was the famous one in, in 92, uh, which was the Valdez uh, one. And that was a 9.1 uh, earthquake. And what we were concerned with is if the boat's sitting there, you know, what's going to happen? Is it going to float down or, or, or worse yet, uh, material float over it, bury it? So uh, that was the guess. But this was taken in, in, in 2006. So we knew we had something. Now we had other targets as well, but this, this was the, the target we, we liked the, met, the most. Based on that, we spent the next year doing an analysis of all the information we gathered on that first trip. That was the key. Stop and look. Think carefully. And we put together a collage map. That's what this is. If you look carefully, there's the actual target. They're calling it the Grunion, not necessarily yet. But if you look carefully, you can see a path. In other words, it was sunk and it slid down approximately three quarters of a mile before coming to rest. Well, that's good and that's bad. Uh, it means it's not in the same spot uh, where it hit, but it means there's a slide path. And remember what I said about Ballard's direction to us is look for the debris trail. Slide path potentially is even better if we can find it. Uh, 
Now here's, here's, you've already heard several improbables about, you know, my brother's son's girlfriend's boss and uh, things of that sort. Here's another improbable. There were four United States submarines that were lost in World War II that were found in 2006. Now, there's probably some connection here. The technology was getting better. These weren't found by the U.S. Navy. These, these were found, uh, several of them by family research. The others were all shallow. We were the only deep one. And, uh, but they were, one of them was found in uh, the, the, the Wahoo, was uh, found in uh, Russian territory. So the, the, the big job there was not the technological problem, it was the political problem. Uh, but that's, that's part of the whole, the whole picture. We had different political problems. We didn't have uh, an outside the U.S. issue. We had a within the U.S. issue, is would you be allowed to do this? Well, I'm a believer in, you know, ask forgiveness, not permission. So anyway, uh, that's, that, that's what we did. We, we, we played by the game, but, but we did the logical thing. And there were lots of things that so, weren't so good in that process. So in 2007, we went back again. And again, we used the same ship, the Aquila. But now it was equipped differently. We conducted a whole superstructure and different uh, uh, material and so forth. Uh, and, and this right now is anchored in Kiska Harbor. And it's kind of interesting. I, I don't have too many pictures in, in this show of, of what the Aleutians look like. But they really are otherworldly. Uh, it, uh, there are no trees on the islands. And there are all sorts of you know, gullies and uh, huge things and rocks and all, all, waterfalls all the time, because it's mostly raining. <laughs> uh, and this is the crew. And it included a number of interesting people. One of them was a writer for the National Geographic, which was kind of neat, except the day we get out there, they said, forget about it. We think we're not going to fund it after all. The likelihood of this being successful is almost nil. And in addition to that, uh, we got the same message from other experts at Woods Hole, who said, these are amateurs. And <laughs> indeed, we were. Uh, and they said, you know, the likelihood is less than zero. So in a way, that was an inspiration to us, because it you know, <laughs> motivates you, underdog theory. Uh, this is a picture from uh, high up on, on Kiska. And there was a dock here that was built uh, during uh, World War II by the Japanese and then rebuilt uh, by the US Navy. That is the uh, Aquila uh, anchored. And uh, wandering along this land is also really strange. And I'll show you why in a second. But there were bomb holes everywhere. Uh, they drop, drop tons of bombs trying to get the Japanese out. But it, remember the technology then, they would fly these B-17s uh, from Dutch Harbor frequently, uh, later on ADAC, uh, which was 200 miles away. And frequently, they would uh, take off into the wind so that they actually took off backwards. In other words, the wind was going faster than their flight speed. And then they have to worry about Will they be able to find the airport when they get back? And when, will the wind have dropped? So anyway, it was uh, quite, quite, quite amazing. So notice this is the harbor. And notice this is also the harbor, but in 1938. So there were some houses uh, here. And there was a weather station. That's what it was. Not all these houses were occupied. And some were occupied. The Aleuts, uh, that's the Indian tribe, lived here for a while. Uh, they were captured by the Japanese uh, and, and didn't, didn't make it. But the dog did. Uh, their pet dog was alive when uh, the US uh, military uh, landed some years later. Uh, this was a picture I took, just one of the uh, many submarines on the island. And then there were aircraft guns still there. Uh, so it was kind of strange, sort of a uh, Rip Van Winkle gap in time uh, metaphor. Uh, I took a picture uh, of, of our wind gauge here. At that point, it's blowing 60 knots. That's about 70. But it went up to about 85 or 90 
a couple of times. Uh, and at that time, we were safe in the harbor. But it's sort of a reminder that the weather can change quickly. This is a picture of the, the front of the ROV. It has several cameras there, there, there. Uh, it has an, a sonar, but a short range sonar. Then lots of lights. Uh, and you need very, very powerful lights. You can't, the, the vision, you couldn't see that far uh, when, when we were underneath. That's a picture of the back. It's got uh, multiple propellers on it. But it's a little bit like operating uh, those, you know the game where you have the little claw in the amusement park and you're supposed to pick up the doll? And the thing is always operating out of sync to your motion of your hand. That's the way this felt. I was not an experienced uh, uh, ROV operator. I operated it for a while. And, uh, but it was clear that one needs a little bit more experience. And fortunately, we had a good one here. And this is the way it worked. Here's the, the winch with its uh, uh, 12,000 feet of cable on it, uh, the ROV. Uh, this uh, is a crane that folds out and takes this pulley. The, goes, the wire goes from the cable here over the pulley and then out. And this is the, uh, it's in essence the descender. It's got a different name for the ROV. It's called a clump. But what it was is a railroad wheel. So it weighs about 500 pounds. And there it is being ready to be dropped by the crane. And it heads down. And this is in the ROV shack where you're looking at these monitors of what's going on. And uh, there was a difference in the quality of skill of these folks in there. Uh, I was the nominal uh, uh, project manager. But being a project manager and not knowing very much uh, is, is always a bit of a challenge. Uh, and we had some experts. But the problem was the experts disagreed, like they generally do, right? And uh, so it was, it was a bit of a challenge. Uh, OK, let's see. Uh, I'm going to come over here. So now we're, can you see that at all? It's too bad that light is shining on here. Um, I could hold this up and turn it around. But this is the krill in the water as the ROV is going down the slide trail. And in a second, uh, out of the, the murk will come something that you can see. And uh, you know what's coming? Can you move that screen a little bit over so the light isn't? As it just, yeah, probably it's not going to do it. Okay, so uh, the, the the movement of the krill is a measure of the uh, current, and because of where this was located, the current came from two directions, and so uh, guiding this thing was very difficult. Now we're looking at the stern of the uh, submarine. And of course, that was quite something to see, because at this point, it's actually a fairly complete. Uh, this in, in, the, in the center, or in the, the corner, rather, this is an arm uh, that, with a camera on it that's on the ROV. Uh, and again, I, it's, it, I'm sorry, the, it's not too, too dark. But yeah, anyway, that's it. And uh, ah, good, much better. Uh, that is the rudder guard, uh, or the propeller guard, rather, which was one of the means for us to identify that this was the USS Grunion, because others had had, had those removed. And uh, this is the actual uh, stern, the rudder guard. Uh, down here, oh, that's even better, this propeller. Uh, there's, that's the rudder. And this is a dive plane, but it's in the fully down position. So that's a forensic clue of what actually happened and why that boat is on the bottom. Uh, this is the picture that, that you just saw. This is the United States Grunion being built. 
1941. So uh, that was part of the, and notice there's a rudder guard there, and the rudder guard is up, is up here. So there, was, there were no names on it. Uh, if there were numbers, we couldn't get at it. So uh, that was different. Uh, we assembled a, a sort of a volunteer crew of uh, underwater experts, uh, World War II submarine experts, so forth, and got them together periodically for discussions about what we knew. We put all the three hours of high definition video that uh, I took of that wreck into a uh, drive and sent it out to these people. And they sent us back annotated drawings with their interpretation of what they were looking at. Really powerful. But we also had an artist in the group. And so he was able to take those separate drawings, and here's the, the schematic of the Grunion, and turn it into that. And it was, looked like it had been opened with a giant can opener. Uh, that was an implosion. It imploded because it went down too fast, and uh, the pressure collapsed it like a, a Coke can. And uh, uh, it, it really stripped it so we could actually see inside. The bow was missing, but we could actually see straight in the bow. And here's another uh, uh, picture from a little bit more detail with a few more uh, uh, markings on it. Uh, this is a, uh, 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 the hatch that is just aft or behind the conning tower, but the hatch is open. Well, you cannot open a hatch when it's underwater, except this was opened when it was underwater. And let me explain how that happened. Uh, and, and there's a clue here. The clue is right here. That's the dog leg that seals the hatch, and it snapped right off. What happened when the submarine went down below its depth its so-called crush depth, which is about 600 feet. It's instantaneous. People have done experiments. We actually have videos of people doing it with a tank car, just to show how it works. And, uh, but that explosive uh, uh, decompression. And uh, when it did that, it pushed up on that hatch and just popped the hatch right off. And if the, the implosion would not have occurred if it had filled with water, because you need the air pressure difference. So uh, that was part of the thing. It's amazing the detail uh, that we were able, able to get. This is the propeller and uh, one of the dive planes. There's a propeller like this on both uh, stern sides. But again, you can see it here. This is a long, skinny boat. Turning this thing, you know, I don't know if you ever paddled a long canoe and understood. This is much worse than paddling a long canoe. It doesn't like to turn. So uh, guiding these is an art form and, and a skill. Uh, this was an example of, you know, some of the, the, the life that was on there. And some of these parts almost look new. Uh, some developed a lot of debris on them, and some, some did not. And then we would get back uh, pictures like this with the annotations that would explain why uh, the different pieces are, 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 are broken. This is a hatch that's enormously distorted, probably uh, from uh, the implosion, although the submarine crashed into the bottom hard enough uh, to uh, break the bow off, so there was certainly a lot of shaking that went on. Uh, and here's another view of that hatch that was open and the uh, yokes that were broken off. Uh, this is the actual uh, diagram of how this confrontation took place. The submarine at, at quarter of six in the morning in uh, July 30th of 1942 uh, the sea was fairly calm, and it was in a foggy area. We don't know that from the submarine's point of view. We know it from the Cano Maru's point of view. 
uh, out of nowhere, uh, two torpedo tracks uh, came. The first one went just astern. The second one hit the stern and exploded, taking out the engine, the radio room, and the stern gun. There were a lot of guns on, on the ship, bow and stern and lots of machine guns, which of course weren't going to do anything against uh, a submarine. So uh, this is the G for Grunion. That's its path. This is the Kano where it's first hit. It still keeps coasting on because it had, uh, you know, about going about 15 knots. So even with the, sh the ship stopped, it's going to coast for a couple of miles. And uh, then three more were fired. But two of those uh, were direct hits and bounced off. And were actually, they floated and they were taken in to Kiska Harbor for analysis. Uh, so that's, that's sort of without going into the speculation, and I'll, I'll do that at the very end, uh, that's the story of the loss of the Grunion. But the other part of this is perhaps even more interesting and maybe more improbable. Uh, there were three relatives who made themselves visible as the news about our discovery uh, came into the news. And uh, they were all uh, genealogical hobbyists. But I would argue hobbyists is an understatement of their skill sets because uh, they took it on that they were going to find relatives of every sailor on the ship. And this is actually uh, the cover, uh, not the cover, the head of the second page in the USA Today uh, uh, picture in which we've gotten pictures of all of these folks. And we now have histories on every single one of them. And uh, this woman here, Mary Bentz, has been guiding this. this uh, there's a, um, uh, an online version of this so that you go, you, when you press uh, any of the faces, the history comes up. And then there's more on the other side. You press parts of the submarine, it shows you pictures of everything. But it was a very interesting experiment that USA Today was doing as well. Uh, here's an example of how we found uh, Lieutenant Milliner Weaver Thomas. Uh, so we have his picture, uh, graduation picture, and as a child and marriage. And uh, here's how he was found, because his name wasn't Thomas, uh, uh, or the son wasn't Thomas. We found the wife's second uh, marriage in Pennsylvania marriage records. Uh, discovered a new last name was now Stevens. Found she was listed in Social Security Death Index in Florida. Then no obituaries in the newspaper, so looked in the probate records and found information about her that way. Probate records listed two sons. One was Peter K. Stevens. Wrote to every Peter K. Peter Stevens in Florida and Pennsylvania. And then uh, our Peter Stevens had an unlisted phone, but public records said he lived in Allentown and wrote to every Stevens in Allentown. And a letter that finally reached the correct Stevens went to his daughter's house, and she passed it on. And uh, this next one is, is too long to tell you about, but I'll give you a, a little bit of a hint. Uh, this is uh, Jack Pancoast, the sailor, the top and bottom. He married his wife in the Philippines. And she was in the Philippines when he left on the Grunion. He did not join the Grunion in its first crew. He joined in Pearl Harbor. And uh, when the Japanese attacked uh, the Philippines and occupied it, uh, they moved uh, into the jungle uh, because the sun looked American. And so obviously, he wouldn't have been good, good to find. Uh, after the war, uh, she came back. We were able to uh, trace the ship that she was on. She met somebody on the ship and remarried, but that marriage didn't work out and uh, went on. She became a nurse in, in, in a number of different hospitals in the United States, very highly regarded. Uh, the, the first husband was a bad dude. We tried to trace through him and didn't get much, uh, much help. But we later found another one who, the third one, who was very, very helpful. So when we finally uh, 
found the son, Jack, who had a son himself, so a grandson, also named Jack, um, we called him up. And initially he wouldn't talk with us. You know, what are you talking about? And finally, after we mentioned a little bit more, you know, he broke down because he was learning things about his own life uh, from a stranger. And uh, uh, also the, the son the same way. But uh, that's genealogical detective work and persistence that is pretty, pretty phenomenal. Uh, Samuel Reed Dighton was sort of interesting because he was engaged to the daughter of the vice president. And, uh, and then he disappeared, so she married somebody else. But <laughs> sort, of, sort of interesting. And then uh, this woman here, Caroline, who, who was the wife of Stephen uh, Servacek, who was a cook, uh, she actually came to our memorial service in 2008. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty amazing uh, detective work. Part of the, the ability to do this was that we were able to get stories printed in a lot of local papers, over a hundred. And I, I think there were three programs in the Today Show, and people say, well, you know, why are you, why are you doing this? We're doing this because every time we do this, we get new leads. We find out more about the story. This is what developed our crowd for crowdsourcing, so to speak. And uh, I remember uh, on the, the last uh, relative was found uh, the day we found the submarine, which is another sort of improbable. And uh, she was found because they had a name. And uh, Mary Bentz, uh, first one on that uh, picture list, and also in the uh, US News uh, story, called her up. And she said, are you related to? And she said, I have his purple heart hanging on the wall. So uh, it, it took a while, but a, a book has been written about it. Uh, I'll show you that. And uh, because we had so many extraordinary pictures, uh, we, we actually produced a, a photo supplement to it as well. And another book is coming out by Mary Bentz uh, that is more detailed stories of all these sailors. It's fascinating what you, you learn. This is 2008 when uh, we had a memorial service and we got almost 200 people there, uh, various relatives, which represented about three quarters of the, the sailors. A lot of them didn't make it. And at that time, and this is another improbable, the US Navy officially recognized that we had found the Grunion. Now, you may or may not appreciate the fact that that was almost a bigger task than finding the Grunion. <laughs> Uh, this, by the way, uh, the, the sh ship you just saw, that's the USS Cod. That is, that is a sister ship to the Grunion. It's a Gato-class sub, as is this. And so we were able to go in and verify pictures of that with what we were seeing. This is the uh, uh, forward torpedo, for torpedo tubes. But it gives you an idea. It's, there's not a lot of space in there. You've got to move around. But we even brought Utaka in by Skype. You know, <laughs> Wonders of technology that's cheap that you can do amazing things. He came to our memorial service. And then another rather amazing improbable, and that's this thing. Uh, this bell is mounted on the USS Cod. This guy is ringing the bell during that service. That's the actual picture of the bell. But we found this bell in the Greenville, Mississippi Welcome Center. OK. And I said improbable, right? Uh, turns out uh, there was a relative uh, uh, in the town who saw it and sort of connected and sent us a picture. And uh, the story is, is this. Uh, there was a minister in the town who was a chaplain in World War II. And for a while, he was stationed in Pearl Harbor. And he had come across a scrap heap where that bell was lying. And he said, is it OK if I take it? And they said, of course, no. And uh, he finally he did paperwork, yes. And then he went off to sea. And then one day at sea, 
they had an offloading of stuff, and he gets the bill. And this, this is not something you tuck in your suitcase. It's 150 pounds, and uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful bell. Uh, anyway, uh, he uh, didn't know its uh, true story. And what's more, he was not aware that, in fact, one of the sailors on the USS Grunion was from Greenville, <laughs> Mississippi. Uh, and then there's this one. Uh, that is, uh, I've forgotten his first name, but his last name is Shinoda, and he's the captain of one of the ships that the USS Grunion sank in Kiska. He was, it was a sub-chaser, sub-chaser number 26. And this is his wife. Uh, and Utaka sort of tracked her down, because we said, you know, we've got this incredible collaboration. Let's take it to the next stage. And uh, my mother, uh, uh, when she learned that her father died, and, and we, had, we were living in Newton, Massachusetts, just sites out of Boston, and a dentist in Quincy, Massachusetts, wanted to donate cherry trees uh, for the back of the Adams house in the name of our dad and the crew but also the Japanese sailors who had lost their lives. And uh, us, the sons, one generation removed, we were okay with that. But mother was not, understandably. <laughs> so anyway, it gives, gives you an idea. We're, we're beyond that, but it's, it's important to remember, you know, partly why this is take, taking place. It's, it's more than just an adventure. Uh, anyway, she died last year at 101. And uh, she had uh, three sons. Uh, this is the oldest, Kazuo, uh, and that's Chio Shinoda. That's Yutaka Iwasaki, and that's Masaki, and that's Tetsuo. Uh, and this is, yeah, Isamu uh, Shinoda, and that's uh, Kazuo, who you just saw a little bit older. And this is when they were married in 1932. Now, what's interesting here, of course, is my dad uh, died, but he had three sons, just like he did. And as we tracked their lives and our lives, it really is kind of fascinating. Part of that, that that's in the book as, as well. Uh, she sent us these prayer, prayer bags. Uh, we had sent her some flowers from Kiska, another improbable, but it turns out that's what her husband had done when he was on Kiska. So, kind of symbolic. A uh, few other little improbables here. This, my, my two brothers there, uh, Brad died, but Bruce the oldest is sort of younger than I am. And uh, one of the things that, that has been sort of, you know, continuing improbable is uh, the collection of all of them. And the fact that this is a story not just about an adventure in finding a submarine, it's sort of a recognition of the fact that 50 million people lost their lives in World War II as a result of the war. And uh, uh, well, I've forgotten what the number actually of US soldiers were, but it's also in the millions, and of course uh, uh, others as well. Uh, it was game changing, and I, th I think we failed to appreciate what we have protected. And so this story is kind of a celebration of thank them for what they've done for us. And so uh, a nice sort of little prayer. This is my dad's marker in uh, Arlington Cemetery. And that's the Kiska Volcano. That is also an improbable. The number of days you see it top to bottom is about three days a year. Thank you.
Uh, any questions uh, on it? I, I, I've got a lot more to tell. Yeah. Um, well told story. Really enjoyed it. The only piece I missed was the ship's bell. Uh, the, the Navy ship's bell. Why was it not on the running? Good question. Uh, basically, the ship's bells were always taken off before war duty. The other thing is they removed the numbers. You saw on the cod. Uh, it had the big number on it. Well, the Grunion used to have that, but they always painted those over uh, before they went to war. But they removed the, the bells uh, as, as, as well. Now, let me tell you one other thing that's kind of interesting. What's the speculation of uh, why did it sink? Uh, they were shooting uh, shells at it, yes, but those shells would not have penetrated the double hull uh, uh, at all. And there is, in addition to the log, we have uh, interviews with several other witnesses who were on the ship who were not part of the ship, a medical officer and so forth. And uh, they reported some of the elements of things that were going on. But one of the things they reported was that there was a circular trail of bubbles. Now, uh, in World War II, in the early part of the war, they did have problems with torpedoes. And there were a series of problems. One is they had problems with the detonator. Clearly, two of the uh, torpedoes he shot had those problems. And the naval brass basically said, this is an operator problem, not a product problem. And they didn't have enough torpedoes, so what are you going to do? Uh, but there were a few other questions, and that is occasionally they would not go straight. They would go in a circle, and that's called a circular run. And a number of United States submarines were sunk by their own torpedoes in World War II. We think this may have been one of them. It didn't explode, but it didn't have to. The submarine was uh, just down to periscope depth. And we have a record of what happened with five torpedoes. We don't have a record of what happened to the sixth. The sixth might have been that trail of bubbles. And the uh, torpedo, which wasn't going to explode, hit the conning tower. And the crash, you know, with, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a one ton object uh, moving at 40 miles an hour, uh, would have been dramatic. Uh, the submarine had already undergone depth charging, severe depth charging. And uh, through further forensic research, we discovered that the submarine had been hit when it was back in uh, New London by another ship that hit the dive plane. Now, they checked it out. And it worked, and so forth. But we think what may have happened is with that tremendous crash, they weren't sure what had happened, or maybe they heard <laughs> and weren't sure what's going to happen next. And so they sent it down to dive, but it got jammed. Those were mechanical systems. If you ever had a gear that jams in one direction, you know what I'm talking about. And the submarine takes a steep angle. I'm sure they, they uh, uh, blew tanks to try to straighten it out. But basically, they've got something like two minutes before it hits 60 feet. And it's now at a steep angle, and you're trying to grab onto these things. Uh, they, they were in a, a very, very difficult position. Once they hit 600 feet, it was lights out. That was it. You said it took, six, it took two minutes to hit 60, or two minutes to hit 600? 600. The submarine is 300 feet long. 600 is two submarine lengths. <laughs> so it, it's, it doesn't take, take, take too long. And uh, uh, the, the speed uh, when they're going down is, can get very, very high. 
So we don't know. That's, that's a speculation. Uh, but uh, sort of added in with everything else, we're confident that a shell could not have sunk the ship. And they do report that they, they hit it, they said. Uh, the Japanese report said, and everybody on the ship yelled banzai, and uh, they, they, they were pleased. And there was a uh, underwater explosion, they heard, uh, and then a huge bubble of oil. Uh, but uh, we think that may have come when it imploded. Uh, it was 3,200 feet, about a little. It's, it's, it's very, very interesting down there. Uh, I, we've got videos, and you see jellyfish, you know, look like basketballs, and it's really, really amazing stuff. Yeah? Um, uh, two interrelated questions, I think, on these here. So you were looking for the relatives as you were looking for the ship? I'm sorry? The were you looking for the relatives? Of yes, the yes, the relatives of the crewmen. Yes, you were looking for the ship at the same time? Well, that was the fascinating thing about this crowd that we had, because they took on these tasks and they managed themselves, and then would come back and say, oh, you've done all this, wow. And so we, we sort of coordinated it, but that was done simultaneously <laughs> with the other things that we were doing. And we had other people doing research on their own and then sending us all these connections. And that, that was sort of the heartwarming part about it. It was an incredible collaboration with people who didn't know each other. We had people from Australia and Brazil and Israel uh, who had these very interesting pieces of information. And so, the, so you were pointing out in the beginning four subs were found in 2006. Um, yeah. Do you think it was the connectivity of the internet that helped locate them. Oh, we never internet. could have gotten it without the internet. That, that, what, that was, you know, I think now, even as, as my memory starts to go downhill a little bit, I'm saying, I, I, you know, I carry the rest of it in my smartphone. That's, and I'm, I'm netting out, maybe even slightly ahead. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this case, people were dying off, but the internet was getting stronger, so we were able to reach more people and relatives of more people. Uh, before they died. And uh, we, we gave a lot of talks, and when that happened, people would feed back new information to us. It, it was really a fascinating thing that I think goes on in a lot of different situations. This one was particularly powerful, I think, because, uh, you know, clear motives uh, and a very diverse group of skills of people involved. And, and, and backgrounds and cultures. And if you've ever read The Wisdom of Crowds, that's kind of the, the key to, that's how you get collective intelligence. Yeah? You make it sound very easy, but wasn't it extraordinary that you could find that submarine? That's the most improbable of improbables. And when we dropped that our ROV down, we found it in 20 minutes. Wow. And we had, <laughs> we, <laughs> We had, we had an expert uh, on from uh, 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 the Woods Hole, David Gallo, and he's, he talks all over the world. And he said, you know, this can't possibly happen. And my other question is, how many submarines would have been launched in World War II, and how many sank were torpedoed? Uh, 270 and 52. What? 270 and 52. Oh, no, no, there were some later on from Portsmouth and from uh, San Diego. And uh, the Japanese claimed that they had sunk 400, which was <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's great, great, great story. Did we launched many more than other countries? Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, the story of World War II was industrial might. Mm -hmm. We figured out how to make things fast. Uh, in in uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, uh, they were turning out a destroyer every six weeks. Now it takes about three three years. Long story. And but this, how old was your father? He was 39 when he died. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm being there and watching this thing, and, and we did a little ceremony, and I, I, I took water from the area 
over the sub and put it in the vials, send it out to all, all the relatives. And my comment was they wanted to be found. You know, <laughs> we had help. Call it whatever you will, divine guidance or, or, or something else. Uh, that's why the list of improbables <laughs> it sort of blows, blows our mind. There's another sort of strange element. When we did the uh, sonar search, we also looked for some of the Japanese ships that had been sunk. There was a destroyer, and of course, uh, the uh, subjects my dad sank. And we sort of saw them on sonar, so we went to find with the ROV. And we could not find them. And we had a Japanese person on the ship who happened to be head of the sonar, of the ROV crew. And he said, he had talked with Yutaka and other people in Japan, and he said the Japanese did not want to be found. So, yeah, I mean, did not want to be found. Remember, after World War II on the islands, you know, there are a lot of people who never gave up. They were still there in, in the late 50s. So uh, that's what makes it a, a fascinating kind of social cultural thing as well as all the other technological things, the collaboration and, and the, uh, the improbability of, of a lot of things happening all in one project. Yeah? Uh, I'm just curious, the, you had a schematic of the boats, the encounter with the yeah. The, uh, the Kanamaru got hit and then kind of drifted off. And it was interesting that the track of the Grunion was kind of interesting in, in that it, it all of a sudden turned around on, on itself and went back. It, would that be a normal military tactic in that kind of situation? I, I'm just wondering why. If the, the stern gun uh, was inoperative. The stern gun was inoperative. Oh, to get oh, out of the way of the bow gun, you go behind the ship. But a lot of people, we don't know. A lot of people thought that the sub was surfacing to sink the, the, the freighter with uh, uh, its, its deck gun. Because it, uh, it had a deck gun. The deck guns got larger uh, during the course of the war, <laughs> as people figured out. And a lot of people just said, you know, sort of the hell with what I'm given. I'm gonna, I can grab this one from this other ship and stick it on myself. So th th these, these sub commanders were very entrepreneurial. Yeah. What would be the size of the cannon uh, on the ship? Uh, eight, eight centimeters or three inches. Yeah. Kind of thinking of the uh, National Geographic. Uh, or writer who bailed. Uh, well, he didn't bail. The writer stayed. In fact, he called up Reader's Digest, and Reader's Digest said, we will, we'll, we'll help you out. But after we found it, he got another message from Reader's Digest and said, oh my god, did we screw up. <laughs> so, well, excuse me, because he represented a, kind of a skeptic, and as I think most society is about the venture it's this much of a long shot. What, what um, kept you going uh, on a quest of this sort, um, other than the, uh, the personal attachment? But you must have had some conviction that there was going to be the possibility of success at the end? Oh, yeah. I, 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 first of all, the help that we had was so phenomenal. And yes, people were skeptical. But they gave us good advice, and we were learning along the way. And actually, during the actual uh, driving this ROV around, we had a number of, of experts or other people who had submarine experience. Uh, uh, we had a cousin who was a Navy captain, and he, had, he was a documenter of a great extreme. And so we were able to put all these things together and uh, you'd like to think it's almost a dirty dozen kind of model uh, of different sets of skills, not entirely purposeful, but at least partly purposeful. But we lucked out because we had an ROV operator who was off the charts phenomenal. And uh, at one point, the ROV was exploring around, and it's got its, its long cable. 
and we were looking at the conning tower, going around it, and somebody looked back up, and the cable was wrapped around the superstructure. Uh-oh, a million dollars down the drain? Uh, he just turned this thing around, and you know, turning it around, is, I keep thinking that, you know, picking up the dog with the claw. He was really good. It turned around and undid itself. And so that's, that's, you know, skill is a good thing to have, and judgment is pretty good, too. You said you use side scan radar, so I mean, uh, sonar. Sonar. Which would mean that the, the thing was on the side of a mountain, and you were looking at it, you were looking at it. You were down in the trench. You were, you wouldn't find it. It would be shadowed by ridges. So, so you, was it a lot deeper in other areas? I guess it's, it's, you're looking at it from the side. It went from, yeah, I mean, obviously it went from the surface down. The, the, the sea is pretty deep at that point. It, you know, it's 25,000 feet. Uh, so, it's, you know, it goes down over, over distance. Uh, but I, I didn't point it out, but if you notice that first picture, the cigarette smudge picture, yes. it's pretty blank around it. There were no rocks near. Yet, in other areas, it was loaded with rocks. We lucked out. Maybe more than lucked out. So it's we had so help. It's actually sitting on the side of a mountain. It's sitting on the side of a mountain. And a lot of people ask, well, did you take anything back? No, we didn't. Uh, there was a lot of, some of our group was a bit paranoid, understatement, uh, paranoid. Uh, that we were breaking the law. You know, you know my view is, is society survives despite the law, not because of it. But, and, and yes, I know you need laws, but it's always that magic amount. And, and, uh, but we had people who said, no, you've got to get permission to do it. And the Navy said, you never can touch a ship. And there are always people who are delighted to tell you that you're breaking the law. And, uh, we even had a group, and this is always going to happen, when it became apparent that we were going back to search it, uh, we had gotten feedback that the Navy was actually going to send out a ship and beat us to it. <laughs> but fortunately, we, we had the secret information, so we weren't going to give them that. <laughs> and we weren't supposed to be in Kiska either. Come on. And, and uh, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Making laws that you can't enforce. <laughs> it's always a problem. We keep learning about that as a country. How do you rate this with what you've done in your life? I've been very fortunate. I've had amazing experiences. And you know, A, the fact that I'm here, <laughs> I, I, I feel pretty good. Because I wasn't, not only did my mother lose her husband, but she almost lost me. Because I had osteomyelitis when I was a kid. And at that time, uh, you weren't supposed to make it. I was given sulfur drugs. It's a, it's a staph infection. And I was operated on multiple times, and each time, you know, the odds got worse. And, you know, I was a little kid. I didn't really know much about that. But uh, they tried a drug out on me, and it didn't work. So my doctor, and this is the improbable there, tried it out again. I had 600 shots the first time. I had 12 every three hours around the clock. Left arm, right arm, left buttock, right buttock. And you use the same needle until it breaks off, and you pull it out with hemostats. And, and, and so I looked like a poor little kid. But uh, the drug was penicillin. And, and you know, after I got it, they said, you know, I was supposed to carry a card around. You know, don't use penicillin on this kid. We don't want to use it up. So, uh, and this was early in World War II, where, and that's how I got it, Navy, child, you know, all that sort of stuff. But uh, my mother was, was enormously resourceful, and so I'm, you know, to me it's all been uh, a, a similar sort of thing. And my passion now is understanding the social physics of collaboration. And in and, 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 and our business e experience, we basically change the way medicine is practiced. I think it's for the better, and, and, uh, but at least I'm asking. Uh, uh, the concept of less invasive procedures, alternatives to surgery with a catheter, 
That's sort of what, what Boston Scientific is built on. And the experience of working with physicians all over the world and learning from them, I mean, it really is an amazing collaborative thing with the caveat that they don't seem to collaborate with each other. Uh, but we were fine. So that, to me, is all part of uh, you know, a real a wonderful experience. And, and, uh, no, no, a lot, 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 lot's going on. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for, for coming tonight. I think uh, the story lived up to its billing. And uh, I look forward to doing more things like this with, uh, with Champlain College. I hope that the Ethan Allen Institute partnership can continue. Now, as I said, if anybody's interested in learning more about the Institute, we have a sign-up sheet in the back. Thank you very much for being here.